Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockets OG TV, the GMAT edition. My name is Jim Jacobson, and we're going through the official guide to the test, the official guide to the GMAT test, the Graduate Management Admissions Test, and we're going through the 12th edition, like it says in the lower left-hand corner, um, and you're on, of course, grocket.com. <clears throat> when we left off last time, we, well, really I, but I mean, if you were following along, then it was both of us. Um, we finished up uh, number 72 on page 279, and so we were going to begin the next section, um, the next group of questions as advertised. Uh, number 73 on page 279 is where we're going to pick up. So page 279, question number 73. And as I always do and always mention when I do data sufficiency questions in these broadcasts, I write down what each of the answer choices stands for in an abbreviated form, 1 to 10. Uh, statement A is that 1 alone is sufficient. Uh, answer choice B is that 2 alone is sufficient. C is that they're insufficient on their own, but together they represent a sufficient quantity to answer the question. Uh, D is that either one, E stands for either, uh, either one is sufficient on its own. And uh, answer choice E is that is and for neither, neither they are they are neither sufficient on their own nor sufficient together to answer whatever the question is. And I explain it every time, and so those of you who are watching the broadcast regularly are probably sick of hearing that story, but um, I can't actually be sure that once these broadcasts are recorded that everyone's going to watch every episode. They may actually just fast forward to the one that has the problem that they want to hear about. So um, that's why I do that to you. It's not because I forget that I said it the previous 10 times. Anyway, question number 73. If m is an integer, is m odd? Wow, I'm having trouble writing today. OK, is m odd? A good question. Uh, there's nothing in, this, in the question itself that gives us any information about the qualities of m, so we do need to just get to the statements m divided by 2 is not an even integer. And on the surface of that, it sounds like it ought to be a, um, a guarantee that m is in fact odd. Uh, so if we do, you know, m, m equals 6, m over 2 equals 3. So, you know, there m over 2 is not an even integer. However, it's also possible to do something where m equals 5, um, and then 5 halves, of course, isn't even an, an integer at all. And so with two different um, answers, we have one where uh, we have two ways of getting something that is not an even integer, one where m is even, and one where m is odd. Since the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no, or you know, we, we get uh, um, you know, a range of values, a yes, no question, is not sufficient. So uh, we can get rid of answer choices A and D. Statement 2 tells us that m minus 3 is an even integer. So it's worth noting that 3 is an odd number. So you know we have something minus an odd number equals an even number. And just by picking some other numbers, you know, and this is 3, um, picking some other numbers, you know, 9 minus 3 or 6 minus 3. Here we have an odd minus an odd. 9 minus 3 is 6, which is even. 6 minus 3, even minus odd, gives us another odd number. So in this case, it must be an odd number minus an odd number that gives us an even number. So if m minus 3 is even, m itself must be odd. This is sufficient to tell us, yes, that m is odd. So we can circle or square or quadrilateral, if that, if I made all four sides meet, um, we can identify answer choice B as the correct answer and cross off C and E. Choice two, or statement two alone, is sufficient. Still page 279. Now we are on question number 74. What is the area of triangular region ABC above? So let's get that up there. Diagrams are useful. 
and then we have this here. So yes, I know it doesn't look exactly like the one in the picture, but if we waited for me to get it exactly right, there'd be three questions in the broadcast. So we have A, B, C, D, X degrees. Okay, that looks good. Um, the area of the triangular region, the, thing, the only figuring that we can do in advance is figuring that we're going to need to use the area of a triangle formula. So the area of a triangle equals one half the base times the height of the triangle. That's all we can do without the statements. Statement one, the product of BD and AC is 20. So B, no, D times AC equals 20. What does that do for us? So BD is this, and AC is this, which if you're following along at home and pay, or paying attention to the anatomy of a triangle, AC is the value of the base, and BD is the value of the height. So right here, um, in statement one, we have the base times the height. The area of the triangle would be one half of that. So it would be one half of 20, which is 10. And of course, we don't actually have to figure that out. It wasn't like hard to do, but uh, we could have just stopped here as soon as we realized that um, 20 was the base times the height. This one's sufficient. So we can cross off B, C, and E. All three of those require statement one to be insufficient. Statement number two, we have X equals 45 where here we assume degrees because x had a little degree sign originally. Um, x equals 45, which is useful. It tells us that, um, you know, that, uh, that it's a 45-45-90 triangle, or a 45-45, well, what does that tell us? It does tell us uh, that... Um, that yeah, that each of the two individual triangles are 45, 45, 90 triangles. Um, it tells us that this is also 45, and that this would also be 45. But that doesn't give us any side lengths, which and it's the side lengths that we need to determine the area of a triangle. So that uh, is not going to be sufficient for our purposes. We can cross off answer choice D as an option. Answer choice A is the one. Ooh, 79, number 75. So in the xy plane, the line with the equation ax plus by plus c equals 0, where abc does not equal 0, uh, that line has a slope of 2 thirds. What's the value of b? So we are given ax plus by plus c equals 0. It's important to remember that lines are typically given in slope-intercept form. And in this question, we're actually given the slope separately, so that's what we're going to need to do. Slope-intercept form is in the form y equals mx plus b, where um, m equals the slope and b equals the y-intercept, which is why it's called the slope-intercept form. Those are the two components. Um, Every once in a while, the names for things make sense. So to convert this uh, three-part expression into slope-intercept form, we need to isolate y on its own. So first off, we need to subtract ax and c from the left side of the equation and from the right side of the equation. So we would get by equals negative ax minus c. So we just move these guys over here. And then we need to divide by b to get y on its own. So we get y equals negative ax over b minus c over b. So that's our slope-intercept form. We could also rewrite it as y equals negative a over b times x minus c over b. And the slope is 2 thirds. So um, we know then uh, that negative a over b equals 2 thirds. But it actually could be negative 2 over 3 or 2 over negative 3. 
or some other multiples of that. So without knowing whether A or B is the one that's negative, you know, responsible for reversing the sign of that, um, we can't actually go any further, so that's why we hit the statements. So um, statement one says A equals four. So what that means then, of course, is that B is going to equal negative six because, you know, we have uh, negative A over B equals two thirds. And we also then know that negative four over B equals two thirds. So then we know that B has to equal um, negative six in order for this equation here to equal two thirds. So this one is sufficient for us to answer the question. It's not gonna be answer choices B, C, or E. Statement two, on the other hand, gives us uh, C equals negative six. Now getting C doesn't really help us because we don't know anything about B or A in this question. Um, and since the question hinges on the slope, um, well, there's more than one value for B that could give us um, C over B as, as the um, y-intercept. So without any information about A or B, we could have multiple values for each of them, and multiple values are not sufficient on value questions. This one is actually asking what is the value of B, so because there's multiple combinations, statement two is insufficient. It's not answer choice D, it is answer choice A. Statement one on its own is sufficient. Two seventy nine. Question number seventy six. If m, p, and t are positive integers and m is less than p is less than t, is the product of m, p, t an even integer? So we know. Um, m is less than p and that's less than t they're both less than t is m p t even and that's a yes no question so always yes always no will be our sufficient answers or or, or sufficient answers that will make a statement sufficient um, sometimes yes sometimes no will be insufficient let's take a look and see what we have we find out that t minus p equals p minus m. So what this tells us is that in the um, inequality here, m is between p and t, is that the distance from p to t is the same as the distance of between p and m. So p is the midpoint of the sequence m p and t, which means there's an odd number of numbers in that sequence, you know, um, but we don't know how many numbers are in it. So, I mean, just to use some examples here, one, two, three, four, five, and two, three, four, five, six. So this would be the same as saying m, p, and t. Uh, p and t and p and m are the same distance from each other, but depending on whether m and t are both even or both odd, that answers whether m, p, t is going to be even or odd. Or the product m, p, t is an even integer. So, moving on. So it's not sufficient for us to answer the question. We don't know whether which one of these is true. So then we, we actually have to move on to statement two. Um, sorry, I lost my place on the page here. Okay, anyway, statement two, T minus M equals 16. Oh, T minus M, that's a minus, equals 16. So that tells us the distance from in, uh, in our same thing here, it tells us the distance along here is 16, 
but it still doesn't tell us whether m, p, and t are even or odd, respectively. So um, this one is also, sorry, I forgot to cross out the things. This one is also insufficient. So we can cross out a, we can cross out b, and we can cross out d. Even in conjunction, we're still not sure whether m, p, and t are even or odd. Um, we just know that they're equally spaced across uh, some numbers. So without knowing anything more, the two are insufficient, even together, enter choice E. Sorry on that last one, I should have pointed out um, that it isn't necessarily clear um, that the actual middle of the num actual middle number is p. It could actually be that uh, it's between uh, numbers. Anyway, sorry about that. Still page uh, 279, now on to number 77. That's what that pause was for. I was suddenly realizing, hey, the middle number, one of the numbers must be even, so the product has to be even, but um, that doesn't necessarily need to be true because not all the numbers need to be, um, they could all be odd, for example. Anyway, <clears throat> number 77. Each week a certain salesman is paid a fixed amount equal to $300 plus a commission equal to 5% of the amount of his sales that week over $1,000. What is the total amount the salesman was paid last week? So, you know, if we want to convert the statement into algebra, we can say P equals that salesman's pay and S equals the salesman's sales. So the salesman pay, salesman's pay equals um, that $300, like the problem says, um, plus an additional 5% of the sales over $1,000. So that's 0 0.05 times the sales minus 1000 that accounts for the sales only over $1,000. Let's do that. So that's what we can get just from the um, question stem. Um, we can answer the question about how what the total amount the salesman was paid last week by getting one of the two um, variables. It could actually just tell us what the total pay was. Um, it could tell us what the total sales were. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, if it just flat out gave us the pay, then we'd have the answer. So since they don't usually do that for us, we, we can assume it's probably going to be in terms of the sales, if anything. Statement one, the total amount the salesman was paid last week is equal to 10% of the amount of his sales last week. Salesman was paid 10% of his sales. So again, using this formula that we have, where P equals 300 plus 5% of S minus 100, we know that the pay was 10% of his sales, so the whole thing will be in terms of his sales. So 10% of his sales, which is his pay, equals 300 plus 0 0.05 times S minus 1,000. So now the whole thing is in terms of S, and um, it doesn't look like it's going to be very pleasant to figure out, but since we have one variable and one equation, we know that we could solve for S in this one. So statement one is going to be sufficient on its own. We can cross off B, C, and E. Let's take a look at statement two. The salesman's sales last week totaled $5,000. So here's the simple one that we were looking for, where we were just given the value of S outright. So the pay would equal 300 plus that 5% of the sales um, over 1,000, which would be, you know, so S minus 1,000 is the same thing as 5,000 minus 1,000 or 4,000. So it would be 5% of 4,000 plus 300. And again, we don't actually have to do that math since it's all numbers at that point. We just know that we could do it and we can mark statement two sufficient. So it's not one alone. It is both of them or either of them, excuse me. Answer choice D. Two seventy nine number seventy eight. 
total of $60,000 was invested for one year. Part of this amount earned simple annual interest at the rate of X percent per year, and the rest earned simple annual interest at the rate of Y percent per year. If the total interest earned by the $60,000 for that year was $4,080, what is the value of X? So, simple annual interest. or really simple interest of any type. Uh, simple interest of any type is uh, interest where the interest is added on uh, or computed based on the original principal only and then um, accrued uh, at some regular interval. Annual is just the one of the ways that you could choose to do it that you just, comp you just sorry, I don't want to use the word compound. There is no compounding in simple interest. So the interest is simply equal to the principal times the rate times the time where um, principal is the amount that you invested, the rate equals the interest rate, and then the time is really just, it, it's not necessarily in fractions of a year, it's the number of times that you are computing the interest. If it's annual, you're computing it once a year. But note that the interest that you earn does not then increase the principal. The principal is, uh, is considered constant for the purposes of simple interest. And so principal times rate times time gives you the simple interest on whatever amount. So um, what this means then is that we have $60,000 and it was invested in two different sources, one at x percent and one at y percent. Um, and we don't know how much money was invested in each. Uh, so there was dollars at x percent and then dollars at y percent. Wow, that, that's a mess of symbols. But anyway, you get the idea. We have two different dollar amounts well, they could be the same. We actually don't know how many dollars were invested in each of these two rates. Uh, we do know that the interest on the one plus the interest on the other equaled 4,080. But there are likely multiple um, numbers uh, of the di at the different percents uh, and different dollar values that could get us to 4,080. So we need to know basically what the dollar amounts are and we need to know what the interest rates were. If we have both of those, we can figure out, um, what's the question? Oh, what is the value of x, the percentage, the interest rate on one of the two investments? Let's take a look at the statements. Statement one tells us that x equals 3y over 4, which is the same thing as x equals uh, 3 fourths y. So it tells us that the two interest rates, that x is 3 quarters of the interest rate of y, which is useful, but we have no idea what the dollar amounts are, um, respectively, that, that's being, that are being invested at these rates. So um, again, by sliding the dollar amount around, um, we could arrive at $4,080 um, with multiple interest rates that are you know, x and three quarters of, or y and three quarters of y. So statement one alone is sufficient, it only deals with the rates. It's not going to be a and it's not going to be d. Statement two on its own, the ratio of the amount that earned interest at the rate of x percent per year to the amount that earned interest at the rate of y percent per year was three to two. So um, our the ratio was three to two and the total amount was 60,000. So really, um, you know, it's three units to two units, so uh, we would divide 60,000 by five, and it ends up equaling uh, $12,000. So we know now that the amount invested at X was $36,000. And the amount invested in Y was 24000 But without knowing the interest rates, uh, X and Y, we still don't know um, how much X actually is. These are dollars. 
So uh, statement one dealt with the interest rates, statement two dealt with the dollar amounts, but each of them is missing the other one for sufficiency. I just kind of gave it away. Um, so consulting the two together, um, we do actually have enough to go on. We could say that um, 36,000 um, invested at, uh, we'll call it X. So if X equals 3 fourths Y, Y equals 4 thirds X. So we could say 36,000 invested at X, and we did that because we want to ultimately solve for X. 30 plus um, 24,000 invested at four thirds X equals 4,080. We're not actually gonna solve this right now, but you get the idea. We have one variable, one equation. It's basically just straightforward algebra, and we could solve for X in this equation. So the two together are sufficient. It is answer choice C. Two seventy nine, number seventy nine. Leo can buy a certain computer for P sub one dollars in state A, where the sales tax is T sub one percent, or he can buy the same computer for P sub two dollars in state B, where the sales tax is T sub two percent. Is the total cost to the computer greater in state A than in state B? So the cost of, of the computer in either place is going to be the cost um, plus the tax. In state A, then, his cost will be C sub 1 plus that cost times the tax rate. So it's the cost plus, yeah, you get the idea. Um, in state B, they have different rates. The computer costs C sub 2, and he pays that plus the tax, which is that cost times the tax rate. And so we need to know, is uh, state A greater than state B? Let's take a look at those statements. Statement 1, um, the tax rate T sub 1 is greater than T sub 2. Sub stands for subscript, in case we're wondering why I was saying that. So T sub 1 is greater than T sub 2. Just looking at these things, we need to know both the tax rate and the cost of the computer itself. So just knowing that the tax rate is greater doesn't really tell us anything, because if the computer is way cheaper, state A could be cheaper than state B. So answer choice, or uh, statement 1, not sufficient. We can cross off A and D. Statement two tells us that, um, wait, why do I have a C in there? It's supposed to be P. Oh my goodness. I guess I was thinking P for computer as opposed to P for purchase. Anyway, everything else I said is still true. Uh, we need both the cost of the computer and the tax rate in order to determine which one's more expensive. Okay, um, wow. So this one tells us that, um, P sub 1, wow, okay, I think I have an eraser now. P sub 1 times T sub 1 is greater than P sub 2 times T sub 2. So this one tells us that, and then this is actually, so this is the, statement 1 is the tax rate. But we need the cost of the purchase as well as, as the um, tax rate. Uh, statement two is actually the tax assessed itself, because notice over here, we need the cost of the, the P is the purchase cost, and then the plus P times T is the actual tax amount. So this says that the tax amount um, is greater in A than B. But again, with this one, we have still have no idea how much the computer cost originally, so it's still insufficient. So it's not going to be B on its own. Now we need to consult the two together. Here, um, we still find out it, it's basically very similar information. Statement 1 told us that the tax rate is higher in A than in B. Statement 2 tells us that the tax amount is higher in A than in B. But depending on how much higher it is, 
the original purchase cost of the computer may not be higher in A than in B. I mean, if one has 5% tax rate and the other has 75% tax rate, um, the computer itself um, could be uh, very, very different in price and have very similar taxation. So um, even together, without giving, because we don't have any idea what the computer cost originally, even together the two statements are insufficient, eliminating answer choice E, or sorry, answer, eliminating answer choice C and allowing us to choose answer choice E. I was already thinking about what I was circling while I was crossing off C. Right. So, number 80. So if r is greater than 0 and s is greater than 0, is r over s less than s over r? So this is a yes-no question. Always yes or always no will be sufficient for our purposes. Only sometimes yes and sometimes no will be insufficient. So, uh, and then we have r and s. Basically, they're both positive numbers. So we're dealing with two fractions greater than zero um, and no negative numbers, just to spell that out even more explicitly. So let's take a look at the statements. We don't have any information about R or S, so we kind of just have to keep going. Statement one, R over three S equals one fourth. Well, so if we multiply both sides times three, we get r over s equals 3 fourths. If r over s equals 3 fourths, s over r equals 4 thirds. They're simply reciprocals of each other. And in this case then, r over s is less than s over r because uh, 3 fourths is definitely less than 4 thirds. So this is sufficient to tell us yes, that R, S is, R over S is less than S over R. So we can cross off B on its own, as well as C and E, both of which need answer choice or statement one to be insufficient. What does statement two bring us? S equals R plus four. So it tells us, of course, that S is bigger than R. So even without <laughs> doing any algebra, um, if S is the bigger number, because both of these are positive numbers, so adding 4 is going to make it a bigger positive number. Um, so this, is, uh, this tells us that S is greater than R. So therefore, um, having the, uh, the small number over the big number is going to be less than the big number over the small number. But if you want to do the algebra, we could divide both sides by r. So um, we'll go with s equals r plus 4. Divide both sides by r. We end up with s over r equals um, r plus 4 over r. So um, then we have uh, basically Comparing s over, comparing r over s, which would be the reciprocal of this, we'd have which we'd have r over r plus four being less than r plus four over r, which again is basically the same thing that I said over here. Um, adding four to a number makes it bigger when that number when that number is positive to begin with. So um, yes, uh, statement two is also sufficient to tell us that r over s is less than s over r. So we cross off A and circle answer choice D. Either one is sufficient on its own. Last one on page 279, uh, and that is number 81. What is the value of n in the list above? So we have k, n, 12, 6, and 17. 
And you know, a good habit to get into is when you're given something like this, at least list the numbers in the order that, in ascending order. So you know, we don't know what k and n are, but the other ones are will will be six, twelve, and seventeen. The value of n. So it's a value question. One single value for n is the only thing that will be sufficient. So. Um, statement one, we find out that k is less than n. Well, that, that's actually what we did when we rewrote it here, but um, it doesn't give us a single value for either number. Uh, so even and even if it had given us a value for k, knowing that n was greater than that, but without supplying an actual value, it would still be insufficient. There's no numbers in here, so there's no way that this can give us what we need. Um, let me just back up for a second. It is possible that something like this in theory could have given us what we needed had the problem been constructed differently. It's not the case that no numbers at all always makes it impossible, but in this particular case we have no other frame of reference. So it's not A and it's not D. Uh, answer choice, or excuse me, statement 2, the median of the numbers in the list is 10. Now this is interesting because we have an odd number of numbers here, okay? So, and three of them are already other numbers. So six can't be 10, 12 can't be 10, 17 can't be 10, which means that k or n equals 10. And that's the middle number. So we either have, um, so in order for it to be the, the middle number, um, there have to be two numbers on the left side and two numbers on the right side, which means that the sequence is going to be something like 10, 12, 17 on the one side. Um, and then over here we will have either 6 and n or 6 and k or you know, n and 6 or k and 6. So there's four different possibilities there for which one n equals. Um, if we find out that n, if, if we find out that the middle number, so th this one, this answer choice, and this answer choice make n equal 10, um, the other two make k equal 10, and we don't have a value for n. But in any case, uh, we don't know the value for n from this statement alone, so it's not sufficient. We can cross off answer choice b. In conjunction, though, we actually are able to do a lot more. So if we know that k is less than n, in these choices here, um, there's only you know, two numbers up for grabs, one of the, and one of them needs to be um, 10. The only way k can be less than n and have the n where n where, where the median is 10 is if n is that median. So with the two together, just write this out over separately, we still have 10, 12, and 17. Our only other two choices then are, um, the numbers are 6k, because remember n is 10 here, or k, 6, 10, 12, 17. And it doesn't actually matter which one k is, the question isn't asking about k, it's asking what n is. By establishing n is greater than k and the median is 10, these are the only two possibilities, and both of them have n equaling 10, so the two together are sufficient. And we can cross off answer choice E. It's a tricky question because it does hinge on understanding the definition of the median. Knowing that it's the middle one and knowing that we knew the entire right side of the set really limited um, what positions n and k could be in. Turn the page to number 280. Page 280, question number 82. So if positive integer x is a multiple of 6, and positive integer y is a multiple of 14, is xy a multiple of 105? Wow, okay. So when we're dealing with multiples and trying to figure out whether one thing is a multiple of another thing, really it comes down to the prime factors. 
So x is a multiple of 6. So um, the prime factorization of 6 is 2 times 3. So um, x equals 2 times 3 times um, some other number where it's it, at least 1 and um, some other uh, positive integer. So, you know, x can be 6, it can be 12, depending on whether a is 1 or 2 or 3 or a million. y is a multiple of 14. Prime factorization of 14 is 2 times 7. So y is uh, 2 times 7 times some other number, which could be the same as a or could be something different. And so the question is, is x times y a multiple of 105? So 105 itself has as its prime factorization, the first obvious number to take out of here is a 5. Um, that's 5 times 21. And 21 is itself 3 times 7. So 105 equals, um, or multiple of 105, a multiple just to keep this consistent, would be um, 3 times 5 times 7 times whatever other thing makes it a multiple of 105. So in order for, so you know, really you can see what is missing from this picture. x is 2 times 3 times some number. y is 2 times 7 times some number. Um, so in order for these two things, in order for x and y to be a multiple of 105, we are missing a 5. We have the 2 and the 3 covered, but we need a 5 somehow. So that means that a or b needs to be a multiple of 5. And or x or y itself then needs to be a multiple of 5. Because that gets a 5 in there and it could be a, a multiple of 105 then. So let's take a look and see what the statements give us. Statement one tells us that x is a multiple of nine. Now nine's prime factorization is just three times three. There's no five in there. And so while it's possible, you know, let's just say that, um, you know, so x needs to be a multiple of six and of nine. What if x is 90? So then it's, you know, uh, 2 times 5 times 3 times 3. But if x is, you know, another multiple of, of 9 and 6 is 36, x equals 36, um, then it's 2, 2, 3, and 3 with no 5 in it. So just knowing that x, x is a multiple of 9 as well as a multiple of 6 is not enough to guarantee that there is a multiple of 5 in there. Therefore, it's not enough to guarantee that x times y is a multiple of 105. We need a 2, a 3, a 5, and a 7. Well, actually, we don't need the 2, but we need a 3, a 5, and a 7. We have the 3 and the 7 from x and y. Statement 1 is insufficient, so it's not going to be a, and it's not going to be d. Statement 2 tells us that y is a multiple of 25. So clearly, the prime factorization of 25 is 5 times 5, so that gives us some 5s. We already knew that, uh, that y is also a multiple of 14, so it needs to be a multiple of both 14 and 25, so it'll have um, twos, sevens, and fives in it. Therefore, um, x times y has all of the prime factors it needs to be a multiple of 105. So this one's sufficient to tell us yes, and it's answer choice B. We can cross off C and E. Definitely want to be comfortable with prime factorization on the GMAT. It is one of your friends. So page 280, question number 83. What is the value of B plus C? Value question, so only a single value is sufficient. So we find out from statement one that AB 
plus CD plus AC plus BD equals 6. So we can see actually in here that we have um, a couple different pairs of factors here. Um, we have a times b and a times c, so we could factor out that. a times b plus c plus, and then we also see that d does the same thing. Um, d is multiplied times b plus c, plus, so then we have d times b plus c, which we could then, that equals 6. We could also factor that as a plus d times b plus c equals 6. But without knowing what a plus d equals, we don't have a way of solving for what b plus c equals, which is what the question is actually asking. So it's still insufficient, even though we were able to fool around with it a little bit to get something closer to what we might want. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be d. Statement 2 tells us that a plus d equals 4, which, while good to know, uh, still doesn't get us to b plus c. So um, that's also insufficient, so it's not b. Consulting the two together, though, of course, we can substitute this value in right there. So then it would be um, 4 times b plus c equals 6. We would divide both sides by 4. Um, so b plus c equals 3 halves. We didn't have to solve it, we just had to know that it would be enough. So as soon as we saw that this was substitutable here, we could have said, okay, my shift's over, the two statements together are sufficient. Answer choice C. Two eighty number two eighty four. No, <laughs> two eighty number eighty four. I don't think there are no there aren't even two there aren't even two hundred eighty four in the data sufficiency section. And maybe that's okay. Okay, what is the average the, or arithmetic mean of j and k? So the average of j and k would be j plus k divided by 2. What is that? A fine question. Without information about j and k, we aren't going to be able to figure out the rest, though. So statement 1, the average of j plus 2 and k plus 4 is 11. So j plus 2 plus k plus 4 divided by 2 equals 11. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, we can multiply both sides times 2 and simplify a little bit. So it would be j plus k um, plus 6 equals 22. And so then we subtract 6 from both sides we get j plus k equals 16. And so then j plus k divided by 2 equals 8. So that's enough. That's sufficient. So it's not b, c, or e. Statement 2 tells us the average or arithmetic mean of j, k, and 14 is 10. So j plus k plus 14. 14 divided by 3, because we have three different numbers here, that equals 10. We multiply by 3, we get j plus k. And you can already see that this is similar. So, you know, on the real GMAT, if you said, hey, this is looking a lot like what I just did, you could say that this one's sufficient too, but just to show you how this would work, um, j plus k plus 14 equals 30. So j plus k equals 16. And if this didn't look familiar and you stopped and you kept going, um, well, it means you, you maybe are spacing out a little bit on the GMAT, but this is now exactly the same thing. So if j plus k equals 16, j plus k over 2 equals 8, and this is also sufficient. So it's not statement 1 on its own. It is either statement on its own is sufficient. Second to last question, page 280, number 85. Paula and Sandy were among those people who sold raffle tickets to raise money for Club X. If Paula and Sandy sold, sold a total of 100 of the tickets, how many 
of the tickets did Paula sell? So we know that Paula plus Sandy sold 100 tickets. And we want to know what P equals. P equals what? Who knows? So if we could figure out what S was, um, we would know the answer. Let's see what we get. Sandy sold two-thirds as many of the raffle tickets as Paula did. So um, that tells us that S equals uh, two-thirds P. And uh, so then we, we could say then that Paula, Paula plus Sandy, uh, Paula got P plus Sandy got two-thirds P. Those two things equal 100. So, you know, then it would be 5 thirds P equals 100. And then we would multiply by 3 and divide by 5. And so Paula equals, what, 60. Um, but we don't have to solve that far. As soon as we get to this point, we could say, or even if you recognize that this was a substitution into this, you could stop at any one of these points, point 0.1, point 0.2, or point 0.3. It's not a good use of your time to keep calculating beyond that unless it's necessary to keep your confidence up and you have time. So statement one is sufficient. It's not going to be B, C, or E. Now we just need to look at statement two to find out if it's going to be enough. So Sandy sold 8% of all the raffle tickets sold for Club X. So just to read that again, Sandy sold 8% of all the raffle tickets sold for Club X. She sold 8% of all of them, not 8% of the 100 that Paula and Sandy sold combined. So 8% of the total. We don't have a total to figure it out. There is no total in the question. So knowing that that's what she did is not going to be sufficient. So we can cross off answer choice D. Only statement one is sufficient to answer the question. Okay, last question that we're going to do today, together, you and I, uh, number 86. Unless, of course, you're listening to other broadcasts of mine, past ones, in which case we may do a whole bunch more problems together, but I won't, you know, I won't feel it quite the same way you will. A number of people each wrote down one of the first 30 positive integers. Were any of the integers written down by more than one of the people? 30 positive integers. So there's a group of people and they each wrote down some numbers. Um, the only way we could guarantee that a number is written down more than once is if we had more than 30 people. So if there were more than 30 people, somebody had to have written down a number that somebody else did. With fewer than 30 people, you may have actually had people uh, writing down the same number, but the only way to guarantee it is if you have more people than integers. Let's see what we have from our statements. The number of people who wrote down an integer was greater than 40. So if we have... Um, 41 or more people and 30 integers. It does not take a rocket surgeon to realize, hey, that's more people than there are integers. Someone must have doubled up. And in fact, at least 11 people must have written down a number that someone else did. It doesn't mean that it's 11 unique ones. They all could have copied off of one guy's paper. Um, but we do have enough information here to determine that one, at least one integer had to have been written down more than once. It's not going to be answer choice B, and it's not going to be answer choice D. Next, the number of people who wrote down an integer was less than 70. So, um, what should we do here? Less than 70. Less than 70 people and 30 integers. So if so, did they did uh, an integer get written down more than once? Um, so if there were sixty nine people, uh, then definitely um, there were thirty nine integers repeated because there's only thirty integers. So that means thirty nine had to come from the pool that had already been taken. 
So 69 is fewer than 70, but there were only 12 people, just as an example of a number that's less than 70 and less than 30. Um, if there's only 12 people, it would be possible for each of the 12 people to write down a different number um, and not have it overlap at all. So in fact, really, the range is, you know, 1 to 30 people, they could uh, all be different. And um, 31 or more people um, must duplicate. So because uh, statement two gives us a sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on the number that we pick, this is not going to be sufficient. Um, so we can cross off uh, C and E. Answer choice A alone was sufficient. So this concludes uh, the broadcast for today. My name is Jim Jacobson. I have been your teacher slash tutor slash broadcaster for this uh, past hour. You've been watching this on grocket.com. This is the GMAT edition of our GMAT OG TV. I guess we don't have a non-GMAT edition of GMAT OG TV. This is the GMAT edition of OG TV where we're going through the 12th edition of the guide. Uh, we finished up with question number 86, so next time we will pick up with question number 87 and do another 14 problems. I can't promise that we'll do 14 every time once we get to verbal, but that's the rate that we're going um, with the um, uh, data sufficiency. So, uh, hope to see you next time.